Hi guys. How are you doing? Can everyone see me? Can everyone hear me? Hi everyone. There is a chat button below. Please, can you type if you if anyone can uh, hear me and can see me well? All right. Thanks, Olivia. Perfect, Karina, Diana, all good. All right. Just a short uh, introduction. Can everyone type the city where they are coming from? Just to do a short uh, warm up while everyone joins the chat. Right. Cluj Napoca, Bucharest, Zurich, Sibiu, Yash. It's so nice that we were able to hold this actually online because this way more people were able to join us instead of just a in-person event in Cluj Napoca. So it's nice to see that people around the world actually are interested in this topic. Yeah, we usually do meetups. Many, most of you have been to one of our meetups before. And this is the first time we do a webinar. Hope it's gonna come out well and you're gonna like it. We have uh, 47 participants until now. I think we, we should, uh, we can start. If anyone wants to join later, they are welcome to join. Is that right with you? Yeah. All right. Let's begin. Let's start. All right, everyone. This is um, uh, the first webinar of Innovating Society, part of the Problem Solvers Meetup. Uh, here during this meetup, we talk about innovation and entrepreneurship. And we do that in order to cultivate a mindset of innovation, something that people can get into the mood of, can understand how innovation works, and basically create a community around this topic so that everyone can share their ideas. And during these meetups and today webinar, we, have, uh, we bring uh, experts from different fields, from marketing, business, uh, any type of fields to share how they innovate in their own field. So uh, we are Innovating Society. We do a couple of things uh, mostly related on innovation and we like to do workshops and uh, that's what we like to do. Uh, work with people, do yeah, awesome interactive uh, stuff. And I'm not gonna bore you more with this. Let's gonna go to the guidelines. So everyone, as I saw, has their mic and camera turned off. This is for keeping the video uh, at high quality without lagging. Please use the chat to ask questions anytime and notify us if the sound of video is not working. We're gonna try to keep it under 30 minutes to talk and then to have at the end 10 minutes for questions. I know it's late, I know Many of you are in bed now, are relaxed, so we're not gonna take that long. This is just an informal night, an informal um, evening with you. Let's start now. I'm gonna present you the expert of tonight in marketing, Adina. Hello, everyone. The, the <laughs> stage been, is... I've been staying here for <laughs> the past minute so everybody could see me. You can join. Uh, yeah, Tudor is gonna go away now. So let's begin. We have gathered here today, and uh, I hope that you're not scared because this is not a wed wedding. So before you ask any questions, we're actually here to celebrate the love be between design thinking and marketing and what we can actually achieve with this connection, let's say, let's call it, let's not call it a wedding. So a little bit about me before we begin. Uh, I started to be curious and passionate about marketing since high school. And that uh, made me want that studied properly. So I finished the marketing university here in Cluj. But I uh, didn't practice marketing for a while uh, until 2015 when I actually entered straight into the marketing tech world where I joined a tech company doing product marketing for them. So my main area of expertise is product marketing. 
and I like to focus on tech products or services mostly. I like reading everything on the topic of business, customer experience, tech, marketing, branding, everything that's, that can help me keep up with the world. I have a vision to change the way businesses see and do marketing towards a more customer centric way by combining knowledge from marketing and tech industry. This is why I actually wanted to join and do this webinar with you because the marketing landscape is changing faster than ever. And with the customer needs and behavior changing and with different channels and different way of interacting with each other, business are, businesses are struggling to innovate. And in order to stay relevant on the market with the technology that is here to stay and constantly evolve, we actually need to, the marketing processes and the way we're doing marketing needs to adapt. We need a change in the mindset also in the change of the process and why not become more agile because this is the future, I guess. So now I want you to be honest and uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. So please just write yes or no or whatever you, it's coming through your mind to the chat, but please be honest because that's why we're here to actually have a proper discussion about this topic. So how many of you start the year with a marketing plan? like the long process planning with budgets and activities that has to be approved by your managers. And I, th I think you know the drill. Okay, see we're getting some answers here. Okay. How many of you think of the marketing mix in terms of the four Ps or maybe the seven Ps depending on you, the activities are you're planning? Okay, so is this planning, long time planning and long plans and frustration and uh, instead of actually doing the work, you spend your time planning what you're going to do? Okay, I see. Good, it's nice to see that people are actually using the value proposition canvas. We're gonna be talking something similar today, but it's gonna be a marketing canvas. I don't wanna spoil and give you any more hints. More dynamic, okay, it's interesting. I would like to know more about that dynamic take. <laughs> okay, yeah, nobody likes bosses that don't like waiting. But aren't the bosses the ones who require the planning and justification for the budgets and everything. Okay. <laughs> so the end question is, is it working as expected? Like after you've been your plan and your activities and everything, you start implementing, how often do you have to actually change them? Do you actually have the results and everything goes as expected? It's nice, yeah. So you need a lot of iteration to it all the time. I guess we're kind of on the same page with this. Maybe people are figuring out more uh, <clears throat> productive ways of doing this, but the problem is still that we're using these plans and we need a better approach. We've been doing the approach of the classic seven piece for 60 years now. And I think that's actually quite a lot of time. And I'm not gonna bore you with what the seven Ps are because I'm assuming that most of you people are familiar with this. If you're not, please uh, write in the chat and I can include more details when sending the presentation over at the end. But this is just a quick reminder that it's actually been 60 years since we started using them. And the biggest problem I see with them, they are developed around the product company approach. What this company, product company approach means, it focuses on the product and the future, the features, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
it's focused around the business and the business needs and we're in constant battle to actually beat the competition to have lower costs to have uh, massive products we're using advertising to to the masses and the processes are designed to companies benefits instead of the customer some actually resort to false claim and promises i hope you're not but this is the reality and quality is the one that suffers first and i think we want every one of us when they buy product or service quality is the most important thing and obviously it needs to work so while in this constant beat to the <clears throat> sorry while in this constant struggle to beat the competition, we actually forget about value and we forget about customer needs and we forget about customer experience. Mainly we forget to be human. And I think this is kind of sad. This is making our work not as enjoyable, not as good as it can be. So something needs to change. We actually need to start listening more, seeing more, feel more, understand more, but through the customer's eyes, compared to what the business in particular needs. We need to escape this constant battle to just add one more feature because the main competitor of us did that. Maybe people don't actually want that. So this takes us to, towards the shift to the seven E's. I'm not sure how many people actually heard about the seven E's. If you can quickly say yes or no in the chat. Okay. Okay, so as I see, most of the people haven't. If you do a quick search, you'll probably find uh, different versions, versions of the seven E's. The main thing is that they focus on the uh, customer experiences and it's the shift from products to customers. The first uh, four E's were actually introduced in 2008 and uh, in most places you will find them being constant, experience, exchange, every place and evangelism. They pretty much stay the same. The other three kind of change depending on where you read about them, but they refer to the same thing. So let's go through each of them and kind of explain what they represent. So first we begin with experience that is supposed to replace the product. So from designing products to designing experiences, we need to think of the whole journey of the customer, not just buying the product or using the product. We need to think from the first time they actually interact with us to actually using the product to after one week of using the product of any type of moment has to deliver the same experience. For example, if I buy a software that is very, it's delivering that it's going to, it's delivering promises that it's going to do something and the software might be the best quality and has great reviews. If the process of actually buying that and installing it and making it work, it's giving me frustration and pains, then you did something wrong. So think about your customer, the way they interact with your product and create experiences. Build experience instead of actually building just products with features. Price is supposed to be uh, replaced with exchange. We need to stop beating the market with lowering our prices and trying to be the cheapest on the market or just uh, the most expensive one. We need to exchange value. We need to educate and build relationships and actually know how much the customers are worth for us because they are not just a one-time paying customer who comes and gives me the money and then I forget about him. We need to constantly exchange value with them because their feedback can help us improve our product. And basically it's a win-win situation. When you think of value, I want you to think of in terms of it equals benefits minus price plus hassle. So consider how you're pricing your products based on the value you're delivering. Okay, place is replaced with every place. From separate one place to consistent every place experiences, where they are, go and meet them there. Talk to them on different channels, but keep it consistent and keep it continuous. This refers to the only channel experience, from which I think most of you have heard of. It needs to be personal and uniquely tailored to the customer. 
don't start the conversation in one channel and then restart it on a different channel just because you don't keep track of the data. From promotion, from mass promotion actually, which happens a lot these days, to building your tribal brand list. Promote your brand culture, your personality, and actually attract people through shared values. It's not just about your product, it's about what you believe in, and it's like making friends in the end. And through word of mouth, it's gonna work better than actual promotion. Processes, from one way and top down processes, like it happens in corporations today, like everybody has a script, everybody knows how to do things. We need to be a bit more customer minded and think about the culture and their expectations specific cultures and codes and social interactions and how people are actually different because we're talking globally now and we're selling products around the world, not just to our neighbors. So the customer experience can be designed as an interactive process by understanding of each culture in particular. I'm not gonna mention the rules and legislation here that applies differently. So from physical evidence, uh, evidence to emotional touch points. As I probably mentioned too many times in today's webinar, customer experience, customer experience. I hope you're not gonna have nightmares tonight with it. But this is the most essential thing you need to remember. We need to build emotional touch points across the journey. It's not just a spreadsheet or a proof of conce uh, concept white paper. It's about delivering the trust through every interaction we have with them. And the last one, people need to be replaced with empathy. I mean, we're still gonna be people, but we need to treat people as people, not as objects or as customers. Put yourself in their place. Interaction should be human. Understand their needs, understand why they're there. Don't just follow a script. Have a human conversation with them. And how can we become customer-centric using design thinking? You've probably heard, sorry. You've probably heard about the process, empathize, define, edit, prototype, and test. This is the simplest way of putting it. Steps don't have to go in the same order. You can just mix them. You, the importance is to just adapt and use it the way it works best for you. So the first step, uh, uh, empathize in a way that you can use it into your marketing. Again, put yourself in the customer's shoes. How do they see and interact with the world? Try to understand their lights, the passion, the frustrations, the joy. What makes them buy something? What stops them from buying something? For example, if they're using a product, what makes them change to your product? Do they have any blockers? Can you help them in any way? Think of it as a narrative. A certain persona exists and they have a certain problem where they're currently using a certain alternative and I have a value proposition that's better than the alternative to cause the person to act, of course, because this is the final goal. Now, define. What are they trying to achieve? This is the moment when they're actually putting the list of jobs to be done. What do they have to do? What's their journey to get there? And also remember, people think in narratives. As an X, I want Y, so that's Z. People don't just buy a thing, they have something else in mind. They have a long plan. Think of that. Ideate. Once you have this understanding of how the customer journey is, what they want to achieve, where you are, it's time to actually create the ideas. What we can do, what, where, when. You create an idea board. This uh, functions well, uh, the same as in the growth hacking experiments or in sprint planning. You just put the ideas, you score them, and you prioritize based on relevance and the scoring, of course. Keep the persona in mind, jobs to be done, as well as the goals you're trying to achieve, but generate as many as possible. Once you have the ideas, it's time to create. You need to design the copy, the everything else that goes into the, all the marketing uh, campaigns. And don't forget to set your KPIs and tracking in place because we're gonna have to uh, test everything, measure, get them feedback, and learn and optimize. So it's a simple process, and it all sums up to a marketing canvas. Like some of you said, you're already using the value proposition canvas or the business canvas. 
This is kind of the same thing, but it's adapted to marketing. Now, this is created by me. This is something I use. You'll find similar elements with other canvases that you find online. The importance is that you can create one yourself. Just add the things in the order that makes more sense to you and fill it in with what you have. It's a process, it's a continuous process, but I like this format because it's easy to stick on a wall, it's easy to use uh, post-its to change things, to add things, and you can constantly change it and adapt as you go. You'll have on the top the goals and metrics and budgets which will help you keep on track. You can also adapt, uh, competition adapt, so you can add notes there, change. Your brand identity should stay the same because it's you. You shouldn't just change because change. But your customer and jobs to be done are going to pretty much stay the same. If you're saying the same uh, uh, service or product, you're basically targeting the same person. They will change over time. So it's important to look at their way of doing things. The motivations will change. The blockers will change. The pains will change probably. And the gains as well. So constantly adjust that. You also want to build personas, like individual ones, because you're talking, we're talking about segments first, like a large, larger audience with multiple people that can have multiple things in common. But when we're actually building our plan, we need to have one person in mind, like one specific person with one specific journey. We need as much, many details as possible because that's gonna help us figure out the channels, figure out the messaging, and adapt. Once you have this whole landscape, let's call it like that, the bottom right uh, corner is the conversation corner. This is your actual plan. This is where you uh, know, which, you choose your me media, you choose your stories, the content type, you do the ideas board. This is what changes the most. Everything else changes while, uh, while you learn. So, I'm not gonna go into more details about this. This was supposed to be an introduction about what we're trying to do. I added here a list of recommended books that maybe you want to try. I think they are worth reading. <clears throat> You're gonna have this in the uh, presentation on the email that's gonna be sent to you after the webinar is over. So uh, some upcoming events. We're gonna be doing once a week, still the live events, because if we're stuck at home, at least let's do something useful. So we're try trying to get to actually put in practice all of this and start working with the canvas, see how it works, see how we build it. So we divide it into three separate webinars to uh, actually put in data in different uh, areas and the workshop that's gonna be longer, where we're actually gonna go through the whole canvas and build a play with the conversation part. Okay, so now, if anybody has any questions, you can just write them on chat. Okay. Okay, so we don't have any questions for now. We can... Okay, somebody's saying to me. <laughs> Thanks, Bia. Glad you liked it, and I hope there was some valuable information for you. Has anybody used the marketing canvas so far? Or have you heard of it? Okay, there's actually a question. Do you have any tips on evaluating different product ideas in a customer-centric way? You mean uh, actually building the product, like, like what's supposed to be included in it? That's what you mean. Okay, Jonathan, can you can you please elaborate a little what you uh, what you meant with your question? I'm not I'm not getting it. Oh, okay, so you have ideas you want to select, want to prototype. So you actually use, are you familiar with uh, sprint planning, uh, sprint pl oh, sorry, planning <laughs> or growth hacking methodologies? 
I recommend you, okay. It's the exact same thing. You actually make an experiment. You say what you're trying to achieve. You have the, what you're planning on achieving. You list the uh, res resources you're gonna need, how much time you're gonna need and people and everything. And you give it a score based on that. How likely it is to work. All of this adds up to a score and many people in the team get to vote. And then you actually prioritize based on those. I'm glad that <clears throat> I'm glad that you like it, Diana. Nice to hear you. Mm, I wouldn't actually involve the customer in selecting the idea unless you actually have to show them, let's say, three or four maximum, and there is a clear difference between them because otherwise they're going to be biased towards their product mostly, and they're going to choose something that okay, this is going to bring me great results, fast, less money. Let's do this. So, I don't know, it's up to you, but if they give you the okay to actually try anything, I, I would say just vote and then present, this is, what we're, this is the best option that we're gonna try first. Do you have any tips for focusing on customers' needs on social media? Okay, social media is not my main area of expertise. But what you can do on social media is try to have conversation, ask questions, see how they interact and how their frustrations. Watch groups, see how they, people like to complain. So you can learn a lot if you follow different groups. Oh, did I miss one? Oh, any tools to have an overview of the customer journey on multiple channels? Uh, well, I use the uh, Uxpressia. I'm going to add that to the links. I, I can do a slide with tools if that helps you. Where I can actually build a customer journey and the personas and I have them all, I can export them to PDFs and I just change them as I go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm going to add some, I forgot about this, but I'm going to add for you guys some tools that I use and maybe it's going to be helpful for you. Okay, cool. Yeah, of course, it was, it was short, is what it was meant to be short. <laughs> we didn't want to bore you or give you too many details, but we want to go in more details uh, over the next webinars. So you actually understand how to build this and how to actually be able to use it. Four. Okay, sorry. Okay, so we have another question from Christina. Who can produce content for communication if the topic is kind of technical niche? The subject matter experts are busily delivering the marketing copywriter may not handle. Uh, so what do I do? I usually do if it's a long blog post or it's supposed to be a white paper or something. I do a short uh, 15 minutes interview with a technical person to get from them the most important keywords. Then I do a little bit of keyword research, but then you can actually build the mm, structure of the content you're trying to get. And once you have the structure, if you have time, you can either go online and research a bit and build a skeleton, a very short draft, and then actually either pay for an expert to give you the full type or find somebody in the company who can actually write based on your skeleton because it's gonna be easier for them if you provide the structure and they just have to fill in some details. Great, I'm happy to help. <laughs> uh, how long does it take to fill the canvas on average? Yeah, I'm afraid of going too much into details and start overthinking. Yeah, this is the problem. You need to think of the canvas of something that's going to be constantly changing. So as I said, go out there, print it on the wall and just work with post-its. Add post-its, that way you can change them every time you want. It's easy, it's fast and you don't have to think of it very much. 
to answer your question, this depend, uh, how long it takes, it depends on the business and how much data we have. Like if it's a new business that also has the brand identity and everything, they want a refresh. That's gonna take shorter than it's gonna take with the, a new business, but it depends on the business mostly. You can do one in, let's say one week if you have a team, or you can do one in a month if you actually want to do more studies and more interviews to actually get more data in. But I would say that in one week or two weeks is enough to start with, and you just go from there, test things, and add more data. It's important to keep on moving, not just stick on this planning stage to, for too long. <laughs> yeah, okay, the, uh, the workshop you're gonna do, it's gonna be two or three hours. We're still working on the structure to condense it. So you're gonna see that we can actually build something usable in a few hours. Of course, it's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna show you how to do it. And once you elaborate, you're gonna have a very good one in one week. Okay, we have another question. If customer doesn't know what he wants and he expects you to tell him any advice on the approach, some tips or a guiding that you advise to look and follow. Yeah, so with all my customers, they approach me. Yeah, we want Facebook ads, we want Google ads, business is going, we just want some ads. And what I do is actually start a conversation with them and say, okay, that's great, we can do that. Let's see what you have. And then we look at some data. And uh, you, if you know how to look at data, we'll, it, it's gonna be easy for you to pinpoint, okay, see, this is a problem. You actually have a content problem, a SEO problem or something else. You can actually start Google Ads if you don't have a base, if you don't have a website, a properly set up conversation. If uh, their social media channels are not uh, interacting with each other, if they are don't communicating the same idea across all channels. So he needs to fix those first. And you need to try to understand him the value of investing into setting everything up and then just making more money afterwards because otherwise they're just going to be losing money and from my experience if you start telling people they're going to start losing money they're going to listen to you like that's that's the approach that usually works for me when i explain to you okay we can put 10k into facebook ads right now but your return of investment is going to be low if we do this this which involves this budget and then we put 10k your return investment is going to be higher and usually that's what works for them like Go for the money, go for where it hurts them. Explain, explain that quality can actually deliver better results. Yeah, they don't want to pay, of course, nobody wants to pay, but we can do a lot of things without paid advertising as well. So there are options, but we need to understand the, the customer and what we're selling very well. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, of course, I know. These are some frustrations, but it's, uh, it's our job to try to educate them. This is one reason why we're doing this, because by educating us, the marketers, we can educate our customers and possibly we can work better and in a more exciting way. <laughs> yeah, so basically it's up to us. It's, good. it's a struggle, it's a frustration, I know. It's hard to tell them everybody wants results fast with no money, but you have to start somewhere. The canvas actually helps people and business owners seeing uh, what you're doing in a better way, like in, a, in an easier way for them to understand where their money are going, instead of the old marketing planning and different multiple spreadsheets and just the report you send them at the end of the month with a lot of numbers that they don't understand. It's gonna be easier using this to explain why you're doing certain things. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> it's a beauty in what we do. <laughs> Okay, so if nobody else has any more questions, I think we can wrap this up. 
and you're going to get more details about the events to come via marketing, uh, via marketing, sorry, <laughs> via email, yes. <laughs> and you can just reply to us there if you want to learn any more questions. And please join the Facebook group where we can actually discuss more about these frustrations and figure out solutions together. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Adina. <laughs> Big clap. <laughs> so uh, I hope uh, everyone uh, liked it and see you again next week for the first uh, webinar specifically, specifically on the first part of the canvas, the market positioning and the substitute alternatives. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, that's the one. All right, so thank you guys for being with you being with us have a nice evening and yeah we keep we hope to see see you all next week as well it's going to be our pleasure all right see you guys bye bye, bye.